Welcome and thank you for joining the DOE Formal Worker webinar. My name is Trish Quinn. I'm the program director for one of the national formal worker programs called BT Med. And I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Before we get started, I would just like to take a moment and say thank you to our panelists for joining us today. We have a representative from DOE, as well as a representative from all of the former worker programs. And I would like to give a special thank you to those behind the scene folks that really helped us pull this together. Uh, Loki Harmon, Miles Fisher, Jonathan Corbin, Zach Hubble, Jess Bunting, and there's a number of other ones as well. So thank you very much. So before we start and get into our formal presentations, I wanted to go over just a few housekeeping items with you. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the DOE Former Worker website. The slides will also be made available um, as a PDF file. The DOE FWP website is listed on the bottom of this uh, screen here, and we'll share it again on the last slide of the presentations. After the event, though, you're also going to receive an email from um, the Web WebEx service that will also give you information on how you can find the recording. If you have technical difficulties during the event and you're unable to um, hear, you can email Jess Bunting at the email that was included in your registration email. Should you lose audio at any point, please call in using the phone number that was provided in your registration email as well. All attendees are automatically muted during the um, webinar, but you can type questions in the Q&A at any time. We received a number of questions during the registration and have allotted some time at the end of the presentations to go over those. Just a reminder though, please do not submit any questions that include personal information about your medical results or health. Um, we will provide you with contact information so that you can find the right people to talk to about that. In today's webinar, you will hear an overview of the DOE Former Worker Program, why it's important to the DOE workers, why it's important to DOE, and an introduction to the four site specific and two national former worker programs. Having said that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Greg Lewis, who's going to be our first presenter today. Greg is the director of the Office of Workers Compensation, Worker Screening and Compensation Support, Office of Environment, Health, Safety, and Security at DOE. All right. Thank you, Trish. And can you see my uh, slides up there? You can. All right. So thanks again, Trish. And um, I'm uh, Greg Lewis with the Department of Energy Office of Worker Screening and Compensation Support. My office funds and manages the Formal Worker Medical Screening Program. And I'm here to give you an overview of the program. But before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of DOE to give you some perspective on who the workers are that we serve. So, the DOE, the Department of Energy's origins trace all the way back to a letter written in 1939 by Albert Einstein, Leo Szilard, and a few other notable scientists at the time, uh, alerting President Franklin Roosevelt that they felt Nazi Germany could be pursuing an atomic weapon and they felt like the United States should do the same. So, eventually, President Roosevelt did establish the Manhattan Engineer District and the Manhattan Project starting in 1942, culminating in 1945 with the Trinity Test in the White Sands Missile Range outside of Alamogordo, New Mexico. So the Department of Energy, or the Atomic Energy Commission, as it was known for much of its history, the, the origins were purely weapons related. However, over the years, the mission grew to be much bigger than just weapons. And in fact, DOE over its history has had an extremely broad mission. Um, we've had production facilities for weapons, producing feedstock, making parts, performing assembly and maintenance. Uh, we have nuclear weapons research labs. We have nuclear weapons testing facilities. Um, but on the non-nuclear weapon side, we've also done quite a bit of nuclear energy research. We have facilities exclusively devoted to cleanup and closure. Uh, we have pure science labs, uh, accelerator facilities. We have other clean energy research facilities. We have the strategic petroleum reserves, the power administrations, et cetera. 
So over its history, DOE has grown to have an extremely broad mission. Um, and with that extremely broad mission, we require a wide variety of workers with different skill sets. So we have workers that look like this. You've got your white lab coat, PhD, hard science workers who are working in a very clean looking lab uh, devoted to science. But you also have industrial facilities devoted to the production of, of nuclear weapons materials or, or power. And these are, are more typical of your standard industrial type place with smokestacks and you know physical plants and things like uh, machine shops and fabrication and assembly, maintenance, nuclear operations. And then you've got your support staff like guards um, and administrative staff, things like that. So these huge production facilities are more typical of, of you know, factories at their time during the 50s, 70s, 90s, et cetera. Um, and in addition to the production facilities, you know, you've got your weapons testing. So you've got miners and drillers. The, this is from the uh, Rio Blanco nuclear test, which I believe was in Rifle, Colorado. Uh, but, you know, there was also drilling and mining operations at the Nevada test site in the Pacific Proving Ground and at another number of other testing facilities all across the country. Then, of course, you've got your construction. Um, this is a picture from the construction of the Hanford site, and this is way back in the, this would have been the late 40s or early 50s. Uh, but there are, is and continues to be significant amount of construction going on in and around all of the DOE facilities across the country. And these projects are huge. Um, going back, I, you know, again, the, the construction of the K-25 facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, involved 25,000 construction workers alone. And at the time of construction, it was the biggest building in the world, not just the United States, and was over a mile long. So, you know, historically DOE has had huge, huge construction uh, projects, but also many smaller projects, putting up a smaller building and outbuilding a new facility, a new mission. The DOE mission has been ever changing and construction has had to keep up with that over the 80 year history of DOE. And then finally, we've got the cleanup mission. This is a picture from the Hanford tank farms in Washington state. Um, you know, cleanup from these various hazards presents its own unique challenges. Um, you know, with operations, you're very aware of what you're trying to do and what you're using to accomplish that mission. But the cleanup, you're cleaning up from 20, 30, 40, even 50 years of operations. So you have to be cognizant not only of the recent hazards, but things that might have been in that building or functions that might have been performed decades ago could pop back up when you're when you're cleaning up. So cleaning up presents uh, its own challenges and hazards. So we had to create a program that would you know, take care of all of these different types of workers who have been exposed to a wide variety of hazards. Um, you've got your ionizing radiation, which particularly in the nuclear weapons complex, that's the one that everyone thinks of first. You've got your uranium, plutonium, thorium. Those are very obvious hazards that people are well aware of. But historically, there have been many other non-radioactive hazards, things like beryllium, asbestos, silica, solvents, uh, and the tough to pronounce ones, methyl ethyl ketone, trichloroethylene, carbon tetrachloride. And this is just, I mean, there are literally thousands of chemicals that, that workers could have been exposed to uh, across the DOE complex throughout the long history of operations. And in addition to the variety of facilities, workers, and hazards, the DOE is also geographically vast. So we have facilities, you know, and you're not going to be able to, to read this, I'm sure, but this is just some of the different DOE facilities. And as you can see, we're located in about half of the 50 states and, and in all four corners of the country. So it's, it's geographically um, vast as well. So that brings me to the formal work program. And we had to create a program that was going to screen all of these workers and in all of these locations, which was a big challenge. Um, Congress uh, called for the Foreign Worker Program in 1993, 
uh, and they asked DOE to establish a program for the identification and ongoing evaluation of DOE employees uh, who were subject to hazards during their employment at DOE. Um, the first programs were initiated in 1996, and now the former worker program serves all former workers from all DOE sites in locations close to the residents. So we, we come to you. So the former worker program mission is to identify and notify former workers that they're eligible for this program, which is what we're doing here today. Uh, we offer and conduct the medical screenings, which hopefully lead to early identification and treatment. Uh, we provide information and assistance about medical follow-up and compensation. We do not provide ongoing medical care or treatment, but we will do you know, do what we can to provide referrals or assist people to make sure that they get to the right place, uh, you know, to uh, get treatment. And then, of course, if they're potentially eligible for compensation, we can help them uh, with the Department of Labor program to some extent. Um, and then the, the final uh, element of our program is to, when possible, use our findings to help strengthen current worker health and safety programs at DOE sites. So, um, we believe there's about a 1 million former workers potentially eligible for the program. There's no exact manifest who, of everyone who's ever set foot on DOE sites. And, you know, there are many, it, it's sort of challenging even to identify the workers because the majority of the workers are contractor and subcontractor workers, not federal employees. Although federal employees are eligible for the program, the bulk of the actual work was done by contractors and subcontractors. Um, and then many of these workers were not career employees. Certainly, you know, some were, but many of them were subcontractors or subcontractors of subcontractors, consultants in for a project based activity. Um, you've got your construction and trades workers, your guards, maintenance and other support staff. These folks, some of them have been on and off the site many times throughout the years, particularly construction workers. So it's, it is somewhat difficult, particularly historically, to identify uh, all of the, the people that conducted work on the DOE site. So, but once we've identified the workers, we provide two types of screenings. One, we have our conventional medical screening. And pretty much anyone who goes through the program is going to get your initial conventional medical screening exam. And I'll talk a little bit about the components of that in a minute. Um, but in addition to the initial conventional medical screening exam, uh, all workers are eligible for follow up rescreen exams every three years. And that's not just one. You can do a three year, a six year, a, a nine year, and you don't have to keep to a strict three year schedule. If you if you want to come back in four or five years, we'd be happy to screen you then as well. Um, and, you know, for those who might be wondering, you know, certainly I think we find more conditions on an initial screenings, but having seen the stats and I'll talk about our findings and and, uh, you know, our, our in the information we have on our website later. We find plenty of things on rescreens, second rescreens, and even third rescreens. So there absolutely is value to the rescreen, uh, you know, the rescreen exam, not just the initial exam. So, in addition to the conventional medical screening, our typical exam, we do also have an early lung cancer detection program, which is only offered to certain workers that are at high risk, and we have very specific eligibility criteria for that. And for those that qualify they'll receive a low dose CT scan looking for lung cancer specifically. So for the conventional medical screening exam, um, it's going to be a little bit different depending on, it, it could be a little bit different depending on the worker, the facility, the potential hazards, but the typical components of the exam are going to be a physical exam, a chest X-ray with a B read, a spirometry exam, which is a breathing test, audiometry uh, test, which is a, a hearing test, and then basic blood work, urinalysis, and then depending on the worker, there could be other specialized tests like the beryllium lymphocyte proliferation test or the BELPT. So to, when DOE set up this program, 
we decided to use third party providers. So currently these screenings are provided by six cooperative agreement holders. And these groups are independent occupational medical experts that are associated with universities, labor unions, or other commercial organizations who administer this screening. And they have particular expertise to do so, which is why we work with them. Um, and I know I've mentioned it before, but it is an extremely important point. We do, because we partner with these six different groups and they have different specialties and locations and sites that they serve, we are able to provide these screenings close to where the workers live. And to illustrate that, we've got this map. These are the numbers of people that we have screened by state. Um, and you'll notice the, the states shaded in blue are where we have large DOE facilities. So, you know, of course, the, the numbers in those states are higher, but if you can see, and I know some of those numbers are small, we have screened folks in all 50 states, and I believe Canada as well. Um, so, no matter where you are, we can screen you. So, I'm going to go through each of the six programs, and as Trish mentioned earlier, you're going to hear from each of these six after I'm done. Uh, but just to give you an overview of the programs, we have three smaller programs that are targeted very specific sets of workers. And then we have three larger programs that handle multiple DOE sites or, or nationwide screenings. So the first is the Pantex Formal Worker Program conducted by the University of Texas at Tyler Health Science Center. And they screen workers from one site, the Pantex plant in Amarillo, Texas. Then we have the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, who screens workers from two facilities, the Los Alamos National Lab and Sandia National Lab, both in New Mexico. Then we have the University of Iowa College of Public Health, which screens workers from two facilities. Again, that's the Ames Lab and the Iowa Army Ammunition Plant, both in Iowa. And then we get to uh, one of our bigger programs. We have the Worker Health Protection Program, or the WIP, which is conducted by the Queens College from City University of New York, and they screen workers from 13 DOE sites. Then we have the Building Trades National Medical Screening Program, or BT Med, which is conducted by CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training, and they do screening for construction and building trade workers only from 35 sites. <clears throat> and then we have the National Supplemental Screening Program, Program, or NSSP, which is conducted by Oak Ridge Associated Universities, and they screen workers from eight DOE sites, but they also screen essentially all workers not covered by the other five programs. So if you're from a smaller site that's not covered by one of the other five programs, the NSSP will screen you, or if you worked at one of the sites covered by the other five programs, but have moved out of the area. For example, if you worked at the Pantex plant, but then retired to Florida or moved to Arizona, the NSSP would be able to, to cover you. So those are the six programs and collectively those six programs uh, since 1996, when the program started, have conducted over 160,000 screening exams. That includes both initial and rescreens to just under 100,000 formal workers. Um, and as far as the CT program, uh, almost 16,000 participants have been through the CT program, and we've done about 65,000 screens, uh, which could be baseline follow-up or annual scan. So one person is, is gonna get more than, more than one scan as part of that program. And then I mentioned the medical findings earlier, and I, I know you can't read that, uh, with, but I did want to put it up there just to show you if you go to our website, which I've provided the link here. If you go to our website, we have medical findings. We probably have 40 pages of charts, tables, information like this, this previous slide here. We have it broken down by state. We've got conditions broken down by, uh, by findings broken down by site. We've got it by initial exam, rescreen. We have it by different conditions, or I guess by, by tests. So pulmonary results, BELPT results, 
uh, low dose CT scan results. So if you have any questions about our findings, if, if you have a condition or, or know folks with a condition and wonder how many other people from the site are we finding with that condition, you can get those answers. Again, on our website right there, if you go to that website, uh, there's a tab for medical screening exam findings, and you will have more data than uh, than you could ever want, I think. Um, and, and, you know, this, this uh, I believe this information is going to be available for participants, but you could also just Google a formal worker program, formal worker medical screening program, Department of Energy, and we should, our, our website should be the first result. I know that's how I find things often. Um, so before I turn it back over to Trish, I do just want to say, you know, for some of you out there, you know, we, we, we cast a wide net for this session. So I know some of you have probably already participated in the program. And if you are not sure if you're eligible for your three year, or if you know you're eligible, but have it, you know, it's been four or five, six years or even longer, um, I would encourage you to reach out to the program that screened you. Uh, you know, even if you have no idea when you're eligible, they'll let you know. If you are eligible, they'll get you on the list. They'll get you scheduled. For those of you who have not participated in our program, whether you are aware and holding off or whether this is the first time you've heard of us, I would encourage you to reach out and contact us. And there'll be contact information at the end for each of the programs. But you know, this is a screening program. So the best time to sign up is when you feel great. Um, I mean, certainly if you have specific concerns, if you have a cough, if you have worries, obviously we would screen you as well. But just because you think you're in perfect health, that is the perfect time to come give us a call because our the whole goal of our screening program is to find conditions before you know you have the condition. You know, early I think. We may have lost Greg. Greg. Yeah, Greg, did we lose you? Yeah, we may have lost him. Um, but I think he was about ready to wrap up. So let's just move forward. Um, I need to share my screen. Hopefully Greg will be able to jump back in with us. Um, so now, we're, as Greg had mentioned, we are going to hear from the different former worker programs. So first up, you're going to hear from Nikki Warren, who is the program manager for the Pantex former worker medical surveillance program. Nikki, you're up. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Nikki Warren. I have worked with the Pantex program for over 12 years. Uh, we started completing our first exams back in. 2005 with our principal investigator at the time was Dr. Arthur Frank from the Dornzip School of Public Health at Drexel University. Dr. Frank continues to participate within the program, but in a, a consulting role. The Pantex former worker program from its inception has been managed at the University of Texas Health Science Center and Tyler and currently Dr. David Rowett is serves as PI for the program and Dr. Cynthia Ball as co-PI. Both Dr. Rowett and Dr. Ball are both board certified occupational medical physicians. Dr. Rowett began working with the Pantex former worker program uh, here at the University of Texas Tyler Health Science Center in 2014. Prior to coming to Tyler, Dr. Rowlett was the designated physician and then the site occupational medical director at the Pantex plant in Amarillo. That was from 2003 to 2009. Uh, Dr. Ball has enjoyed working uh, with the program and enjoyed her role as co-PI over the past two years as she trained here at UT Tyler and is uh, Amarillo, Texas is her hometown. 
Dr. Angela Phillips is an associate professor at the University of Texas, no, excuse me, West Texas A&M University School of Nursing and resides there in Amarillo. She has done most of the screening exams and has been with the program since and initiated back in 2005 with exams. Once again, uh, Nikki, I do the scheduling call, updating, outreach. So if you call, more than likely I'm on the phone, please leave messages. I will definitely be calling you back. Um, sometimes depending on the call flow, it might take a little bit, but I do, do return all calls. Um, currently, we are presently working through the process to secure a new host clinic there in Amarillo and um, other areas within outside of Amarillo. Um, the Pantex Formal Worker Program offers former worker plant employees and contract workers who have worked on the site the opportunity to obtain an independent assessment of their health in relation to their workplace exposures by healthcare providers experienced in occupational medicine. Um, our initial screenings are performed in Amarillo, include the physical chest x-ray with the ILOB reads, spirometry, blood test, and urinalysis. Those over 100 miles from Amarillo, we do refer to the NSSP, or you could call them directly, or I will submit the referral and they will reach out to you. Um, those who have participated in the Pantex Former Worker Program receive the results of their clinical exam and medical tests in a personalized, what we call results letter from one of our board certified occupational medicine physicians, along with any uh, recommendations and follow up they have for you. Within the group of participants that we have screened, most Frequent findings have been uh, work-related lung disease, including interstitial uh, lung disease, nodules, lesions, and obstructive airway disease. Slide. Slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, please give us a call if you want to enroll, check on your status. Uh, you can call me at uh, the local number or the toll-free number. I now have an email address that will be provided, the for, uh, Pantex Former Workers at uthct.edu. I look forward to hearing from you, and please give us a call. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And just as a reminder, um, all of this contact information is going to be shared again at the end of the presentation. Um, so next, we're going to hear from the Johns Hopkins Former Worker Program for Los Alamos and Sandia Labs. Um, Dr. Aisha Riviera is going to present that. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you, uh, Trish, for that introduction. So um, Aisha Rivera Margarin, I am with the Johns Hopkins Former Workers Program for Los Alamos and Sandia National Laboratories. Um, we are managed right by the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, and we partner with the University of New Mexico. Our program has been around for many years, and there is an important person that's not illustrated in this slide, Dr. Ma Maureen Cataret, who retired earlier um, this year and uh, pass the torch on to me. Um, so I am relatively new to the program and I work with Dr. Brian Schwartz, um, who is the co-principal investigator and he's been with the program since it started. I am trained in occupational medicine and preventive medicine and board certified in both. And our team um, consists, it's small, um, it consists of an administrative assistant um, who works out of the Baltimore office. And then we have an on-site office um, in Española, New Mexico, with um, two individuals who have been with the program for many years. And um, really, they are the backbone of the program because they give it that, um, that home touch, right? So Rebecca Trujillo and Jocelyn Cordova. Um, 
Miss Rebecca Trujillo um, actually is a former worker um, for the LANL site and she um, serves as our interviewer. And um, Ms. Jocelyn Cordova has a lot of the um, other administrative work that needs to go into putting the, um, making sure that the program is running. Um, we have been going out to New Mexico um, every year, multiple times a year, um, essentially since the program started um, to do exam swoops um, up until 2020 when COVID hit, we had to uh, pause like many things. Um, uh, I think the world kind of came to a standstill in 2020 as we were trying to figure out what to do with COVID, um, how to react to it. So we had to um, a, a pause for a period of time as many of the other uh, programs. And then um, we had to reinvent ourselves. So we're currently um, doing uh, exams uh, through a clinic in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and our goal is to resume our prior model of exam swoops uh, and hopefully in the near future. Next slide. So we serve DOE former workers who worked out of the Los Alamos National Laboratories and out of the Sandia National Laboratory, the one that's in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and currently live in New Mexico. Um, and uh, we, um, you could see here at the bottom of the slide um, that we've done uh, roughly 3,800 exams, uh, initial screens, and uh, 4,600 or so exams in total divided between the two sites. And you can see too um, that the LANL site by far um, has had uh, the most former workers come through our program while the Sandia site is a, is a smaller portion of the um, workers that we've served. And next slide. And uh, this slide has our contact information um, as my, uh, the prior panelist, uh, Nikki Warren said, you know, this is an open invitation. We hope to hear from you. Um, and um, that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Aisha. Um, the next former worker program we're going to hear, hear from is um, Jill Welch. She's the project coordinator for the Burlington AEC plant and the Ames laboratory. Thanks, Trish. This program is administered at the University of Iowa College of Public Health and is directed by Dr. Marek Mikulski and formerly by Dr. Lara Fortes. We conduct medical screenings at four locations in Iowa, in Ames, West Burlington, Mount Pleasant, and Iowa City. Those living two or more hours from these cities are referred to the National Supplemental Screening Program to receive the screening near where they live. Next slide. Medical screenings are provided for those who worked at the two DOE facilities in Iowa, the Ames National Laboratory and on Line 1, Division B, or the Burlington AEC plant at the Iowa Army Ammunition Plant that was operational from 1949 to 1975. The screenings are for those who worked at any job at the facility, for example, but not limited to production, laboratory scientists or technician, administration, construction, contractors, custodial services, guards, cafeteria workers, or laundry personnel. Over 3,600 former workers have been screened and over 8,200 medical screening exams have been completed for the initial and three-year follow-up screenings. Next slide. For more information, please call or email us or visit our website. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. The next former worker program we're gonna hear from is the Worker Health Protection Program. Zach Bussey is the um, program coordinator. Hey, I'm Zach with the Worker Health Protection Program. Um, so we're managed by the Barry Commoner Center for Health and the Environment, uh, which is an environmental and occupational health research institute on Queens College, which is part of City University of New York. Uh, we're partnered with the United Steelworkers and Atomic Trades and Labor Council. Um, we have a lot more clinics than this, but the, the main ones we work with are Net Gain in Oak Ridge, uh, Machen Family Medicine in Idaho, UNLV School of Medicine in Las Vegas. Um, and the staff we work with there also does a downwinders program. If anyone is watching from rural Nevada that grew up around the atmospheric testing. Um, we're headed by Dr. Steven Markowitz, who's 
headed the program since about 1997, I think starting with um, some needs assessment for some of the gaseous diffusion plants. Uh, in addition to being the PI and project director for us, he's a chair of the Department of Labor's advisory board on toxic substances and worker health. Uh, that's like an expert panel that gives the DOL advice on things like the site exposure matrix, uh, the application process, and uh, medical evidence, uh, part of the compensation program. Uh, another thing about our program specifically is we have local coordinators in many of the places we're screening. Um, these are really great resources for, you know, if you're, if you're applying for benefits uh, for a specific site, um, these are people that are former workers of DOE sites usually, and also really involved in the local union communities there. So they're a great resource for, you know, specific information about the sites and the application process as it relates to that specific site. Uh, next slide. As Greg said, we do 13 sites. So bear with me while I read all of them. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore and Sandia National Labs in California. Idaho National Labs in Idaho, uh, Paducah Gaseous Diffusion Plant in Kentucky, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in New Mexico, Nevada National Security Site, formerly Nevada Test Site in Nevada, Brookhaven National Labs in New York, Bernald Feed Materials Production Center in Ohio, the Mound Plant in Ohio, Fort Smith Gaseous Diffusion Plant in Ohio, Oak Ridge Gaseous Diffusion Plant in National Laboratory in Tennessee, and the Y-12 National Security Complex. Um, so if you live in the area of one of those sites, we can get you screened. Um, for most of the programs, it would be about 30 days that you need to have formerly worked at the site in a non-building trade, so not construction trades. Um, for a GDP sites, there's three of them. Uh, we can see current workers in addition to former workers. And for the Nevada and California programs, uh, which actually started at Boston University and moved to Queens College in about 2010, uh, the eligibility is one year usually, uh, but we can see people in any trade, so including construction trades. Um, since we started screening in about 1998, we've seen over 35,000 people as part of the program and since we do rescreens every three years, we've done over 73,000 exams. Uh, our early lung cancer detection program, which gives low dose CT scans, has seen almost 14,000 people uh, as of about June of this year. And people are eligible for that based on things like age, occupational history, and smoking history. Uh, and then you get it every year. So we've done about 57,000 uh, low-dose CT scans on people. Next slide. And this is our contact information. That's the main number. So we can get you hooked up with the correct person to answer specific questions or get you scheduled. Uh, our website has most of the information I'm going over now. Uh, our Facebook page, in case you wanna know about updates to the program or sometimes we post news about related issues, or you can send us an email as well. Excellent. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. Uh, next up, you're going to hear from Kim Cranford, who's the medical nurse manager for the Building Trades National Medical Screening Program. I'm Kim Cranford. I'm the medical nurse manager for Building Trades, and Building Trades is administered by the CPWR. That's the Center for Research and Construction Training. Um, CPWR is the health and safety department of the North American Building Trades and its 14 affiliated construction unions. Those construction unions are real important to us. They're the ones that help get the word out to the workers about our program. Uh, BT Med does partner with several partners. We've got the University of Maryland Medical Center for our medical director services. We've got Duke University for our data and analysis and research. Uh, Zenith American Solutions for our uh, management and operations. Uh, some of our key staff, we've got Knut Ringen, he's our principal investigator. Trish Quinn, our host of the seminar today, she's our program director. Miles Fisher, assistant program director. And then Anna Chen is our director of operations out of uh, Seattle, out of the Zenith office. Uh, we've got several people on our medical team and just a few of them are listed there. Um, so we've got our two main medical uh, directors. 
uh, Dr. John DeMint with Duke University, myself, Janet Shorter, and then we've got five other nurses here in our office that review the results and uh, discuss the results with the workers. Next slide. Uh, now, BT Med has uh, a large network of clinic providers. Uh, we do have um, about 225 clinics across the nation that do our exams. Uh, we've actually done exams on workers from all 50 states. I think we've even done a couple on workers that live outside the U.S. Uh, so, so we do have a large network of clinics. We are a national program. So if you worked construction and you've relocated or moved anywhere in the U.S., give us a call and there's a very good possibility that we have a clinic to serve you. Um, now, BT Med covers the former construction workers from 35 DOE sites. Our workers come from the building and construction trades. For example, we handle the workers that come out of the carpenters, pipe fitters, electricians, laborers, heavy equipment operators, insulators, roofers, just various number of crafts out there doing various jobs. It could be from new construction to cleanup to decontamination, you know, just various uh, jobs in those job classifications. Um, a lot of our workers have relocated, uh, and some of them have worked at multiple sites. They've been on and off the sites. Uh, most of them were considered temporary workers because they were just there for a period of time. The job ended, they got laid off, and they may have. We've got some workers that have spent their entire careers working uh, at Oak Ridge, for instance, uh, where they've come and gone for the various contractors over the years. Um, we do offer a medical exam to the workers. Um, and some of the things we've seen so far is, is uh, we've got about 25,000 workers that are enrolled in our program and have been for at least one exam. Uh, we've completed 43,500 exams so far. So a lot of our workers have returned and taken advantage of getting the rescreen exams. Uh, and as you know, they were talking about initially, um, the Initial exam is important uh, because that way you establish a baseline, but it's also just as important to come back and do those rescreen exams every few years to see if your health has changed. Um, so we have had workers come back. So we've done about 43,500 exams so far. And we too offer the low dose CT scans uh, to workers that qualify. And we've done about 8,800 CT scans so far. And out of those 8,000, nearly 9,000 CTs that we've performed, we have found 55 lung cancers, and about 70% of those have been early. Uh, and that's, that's our goal is, you know, to find these diseases early, uh, because finding a lung cancer early gives the best chance for survival and good outcome. Uh, of course, we found many other conditions. Um, we have detected things that would not have otherwise been known, whether it's in the traditional medical exam or in the CT screening. Uh, there's been many conditions that workers would have not otherwise known about. And our workers tell us that the exam that they got with our program is one of the best exams they've had, that it's better than the physical they get with their own doctor. They learn more about their health. And of course, we encourage them to share a copy of the results with their doctor. Uh, so that's a value too. And a lot of times some of the testing doesn't have to be repeated if they've recently had lab or x-ray with us, they can share those findings with their doctor. So that can be a savings to the worker as well as to their union health plans. Uh, next slide, Trish. So we, we go by BT Med and we do have a website, www.btmed.org, and I invite you all to visit that site. It's got lots of information on there. It's got a little banner that scrolls across that gives you information about some of the toxins and exposures that you may have been exposed to. Uh, we've got a toll-free number uh, listed 1-800-866-9663. Uh, you're welcome to give us a call. Uh, you can visit us online at www.btmed.org. Um, you can email us btmed at btmed.org or visit us on Facebook. Um, if you work construction or you have coworkers, friends, family that work, um, get the word out and send them in free medical service. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. The final program we're going to hear today is um, the National Supplemental Screening Program. Wendy Banani is the program coordinator for that program. Wendy? Thank you, Trish. Um, the NSSP provides medical screening examinations on a nationwide basis. And the NSSP is managed by Oak Ridge Associated Universities. ORU provides the infrastructure that supports the NSSP team and has primary responsibility for the management of the program. 
to form the NSSP, ORU assembled expertise in medical program administration, occupational medicine, epidemiology, cybersecurity, data management, and quality control. The NSSP was initially funded in 2005, and the first medical screening exams took place in October of that year. Our five core partner organizations have remained with the project since that time. Um, our partners include the University of Colorado, Center for Health, Work, and Environment, National Jewish Health, Comprehensive Health Services, which was acquired by Acuity International in 2021, and Cordy. Our screening clinics are provided by Acuity International's nationwide network of clinics, which we've used over 2,500 in all of 50 states to date. We also utilize the Occupational Health Clinic at National Jewish Health for those who live close enough to their facility in Denver, Colorado. A few of our key staff members are Dr. James Stocker as a Senior Director, Co-PI and Physician from ORAU, Dr. Lee Newman, a Co-PI Physician, excuse me, and Physician from the University of Colorado, also listed as myself as the NSSP Manager from ORAU. All of the former worker programs today have been sharing with you um, how to decide which former worker program you should participate in. And it really comes down to three questions. Which site did you work at? Where do you currently live? And what type of work did you do for the DOE facility when you were there? Um, so the NSSP serves DOE former workers who worked in a number of different categories. The first one I'll describe to you are what we refer to as our primary site. We serve workers from one of these um, primary sites, regardless of where you're currently living. Um, those are workers from Argonne National Lab in Illinois, the Fermi National Lab, the Hanford facility, the Kansas City plant, the Pinellas plant, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, Rocky Flats, and the Savannah River site facility. So if you worked at one of these sites and you worked in production, operations, administration, or any non-construction role at those sites, you would be screened by the National Supplemental Screening Program. The NSSP also offers medical screening to workers who currently live outside of a screening area from one of the other, excuse me, from any of the DOE sites assigned to the other former worker programs that you have heard from today. Um, I think that's probably pretty clear um, based on the descriptions you've had so far. Um, and then there's an additional category of workers that can participate in the National Supplemental Screening Program. And those are workers um, who worked at a facility that hasn't been assigned at, to a primary formal worker program since 2005. We refer to those as uh, smaller facilities. Some examples of those are Mallinckrodt Welding Springs, Ashtabula, um, Battelle Labs, Brush Lucky, uh, Nettle. Uh, the NSSP has screened workers from about 34 different smaller sites since we started testing individuals in 2005. Next slide, please. So what have we done um, since we started our program in 2005 through September of 2022? Um, we have enrolled and screened 20,076 participants in our program. Um, we performed 27,486 exams, which includes 7,410 of those three-year rescreening exams, which have been for 5,356 of our formal workers in our program. We have screened formal workers living in all 50 states, as I mentioned. Um, and in addition to our eight primary sites, the NSSP has screened formal workers from 73 other DOE facilities, um, which includes formal, the referrals from the other formal worker programs and 34 of the smaller sites, representing a total of 81 different DOE sites. That's all I have. Thank you, Trish. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> also, how do you get a hold of us? Um, as, as the others have mentioned, we have a toll-free number. We also have a website, and you can email our program at nssp at ORU.org.
Thank you, Wendy, very much. Um, all of the former worker programs today provided um, contact information, and we wanted to share this slide again here at the end of the presentations um, to give you another minute or so to write down the programs that you may want to contact, phone numbers and emails. Um, we will also make sure that we email this information to everyone who has participated and registered for the event. So we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, and we received a lot of really good questions and we appreciate people sending them in. Um, so we're, we have a couple of minutes left in our time. So I'm going to just start right into it. Um, I'm going to start actually with you, Greg, as this is a DOE question. Okay. Um, what is the difference between the former worker program and the Department of Labor EOIPA program? There's a second part to this. Does the FWP help with claims processing? And can I get a white card from the former worker program? You want to take that? Okay, sure. And uh, and by the way, I apologize for dropping off earlier. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, the wonders of technology. So again, I apologize. But for this question, so th the formal worker program is a completely different program from the EOICPA or EOIPA. Um, oftentimes they're confused because they target similar populations and we even partner in outreach and various other efforts. So I can see why people get confused, but they are completely separate programs. If you go through the screening, that does not mean you need to seek compensation. It also does not mean if you get a positive finding, you're automatically going to get compensation. However, it it is sort of it is a program that leads into the compensation program. So if you go through the screening, you do get some sort of result. You may need to go flesh that out further with your doctor, but it may mean that you are eligible for to file for compensation and you may get compensation. Um, now, the the formal worker program, you know, each of the six formal worker programs to, you know, to a different level at each, but they will uh, do their best to help you with those claims. Um, they're, they're not necessarily a formal authorized representative, but they can uh, do their best to assist you in filing claims, but they are not a formal, you know, they have no specific in with the Department of Labor. You do not need to use their help with the Department of Labor. We are a separate program. We are just trying to help you as a as a courtesy. And can you get a white card? And for those who don't know, the white card is the card that you get from uh, the, well, you get a white card. They don't refer to it as a white card, but it's, it's a card that you get from the Department of Labor that covers your medical expenses if you get a positive finding under the compensation program. So the former worker program cannot give you a white card. You know, we may, with a finding you get from the former worker program, that may mean you're eligible to file with the Department of Labor and later you might get that white card, but the former worker program is not going to be able to give you a white card. Thank anything you, to add uh, for the other form worker folks? Did I miss anything? Nope. I think that was great. Thanks for the clarification between the two programs. There is a lot of confusion um, for people with that. Uh, next question for um, Wendy at the NSSP. Since retiring in 2018, I've been unable to find a nearby location for testing. Where can I get that information? And what if the DOE site I worked at isn't listed as a program? That's a good question, and that is actually one of the reasons why we uh, had our webinar today was to hopefully help the former worker population determine which former worker program they should participate in. Um, and so hopefully we answered that question. <laughs> if we didn't, though, um, please contact uh, one of the former worker programs you see on the screen, and we will help you determine which program you should participate in. Um, and then that program can then share with you where the, the facility is located for your medical exam to be scheduled. But the second part of that question was, what if my, the site I worked at was not listed in any of the presentations today? Um, you're likely eligible. If it was a DOE site, you would likely be eligible for testing through the National Supplemental Screening Program, which is the second to the last number on the screen. Thank you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question is, um, it's a two part question. Are the screening programs doing anything about hearing loss and beryllium? I'm going to start with the hearing loss. Kim from BT Med, you want to answer that? 
Oops. Yeah, mute here. <laughs> are. Yes. So our medical exams do offer an audio test. Uh, so they will be checking your hearing and they're looking for hearing loss that follows a certain pattern, which would indicate hearing loss from noise. So we're looking for noise induced hearing loss. Um, so, so we are screening for that. And of course, if you have hearing loss, there's a potential that you could fall with your state workers comp. You need to check the laws in your state because each state has specific laws for hearing laws. And then of course, Department of Labor uh, through the OPA Part E also has that you can fall for hearing loss with their program uh, if you meet certain guidelines. And those are certain guidelines for certain crafts that have had exposures to uh, an organic uh, solvent, have worked a certain amount of time. Um, so, so there is guidelines for that. But yes, we do screen for that and do recognize that is an exposure uh, that you could have from the work site is no reason or solvents that would contribute to hearing loss. And the second part of that question, Kim, was about beryllium. Um, are the former worker programs doing the LPT tests? And what happens when my beryllium test results are inconclusive, um, abnormal, then it comes back as normal? What does all that mean? Okay, uh, the medical exams do offer the beryllium blood test. It's called the lymphocyte proliferation test. It's a specialized test that you wouldn't get from your regular doctor. And there's just a few laboratories in the country that are able to do this test. Um, so, we, so we do offer that and that is something that we screen for. All the former worker programs, to my knowledge, do screen for that. Um, now, if your test comes back uninterpretable um, or it comes back if it comes back abnormal, we're going to refer you for further evaluation. But if it comes back uninterpretable, then we do repeat the test. Uh, there's many different reasons why a test may come back interpretable. Uh, the lab, I'm not going to go into all the details of how the test is run, but they do put um, an additive in there that helps the lymphocytes grow, which is a component of the white blood cell. So sometimes there can be overgrowth of the white blood cells or not enough growth of the white cells. So the test does not respond the way it should before the beryllium is even added in to see how your white blood cells react. Uh, so for those reasons, sometimes those tests have to be repeated. The laboratories do use a different, they use a serum lot. So when that's, they finish that serum lot, they go into using another lot. So sometimes by repeating it later, or doing what we call a split repeat test and sending it to a different laboratory or two laboratories uh, can help to correct that problem. Uh, and then also too, uh, there is a special test that they've come out with in the last few years that's called an autologous test. And I don't know, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but it is a specialized test that they can run for uh, patients that continuously have had an interpretable test. Uh, so, so they have in, improved some processes and are able to, you know, recheck that. Uh, and then Thanks. you asked, why would my test be abnormal mm -hmm. the first time and then followed by a uh, normal? Uh, that does sometimes happen. It, it's not very, it's not super common, but it does happen. And because of about one out of four people who have one abnormal test will not have an abnormal test on repeat. So about 25% of people that test abnormal once may not test positive again. And that's what we consider a false positive or, um, so generally because having an abnormal test means that you can file a claim with Department of Labor, even with just one test, you can file a claim for beryllium sensitivity. And beryllium sensitivity doesn't mean you have beryllium disease, it just means that you have an allergy or your body's had that antigen antibody response. So at that point, if you have beryllium sensitivity, you could consider going for further evaluation. And because further evaluation includes having other tests like possibly a CT scan or a biopsy or a um, PET scan or, I'm not a PET scan, but a, a alveolar lavage where they go in and take a specimen from the lungs. We don't want to just refer everybody for that test. So they like to confirm that abnormal test with a second abnormal test. So that's why we recommend two tests. Two tests are not required for you to file a claim. No, you can file with just one. So, so, so that's important to know. And I don't think they really know exactly why some people will have a normal after having a positive. But um, like I say, go ahead and file the claim with one. If you have any symptoms of lung disease that you have a concern about, um, you know, then your doctor may decide that you need to go for further evaluation. Okay. Thanks, Kim. One. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. We're coming up on the hour, but I think we can squeeze a few more in. Um, uh, many people ask this, what is a B reader? Why does my x-ray go to a B reader? Um, Nikki, would you be able to answer that one? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, B readers are specially trained radiologists that are credentialed by uh, NIOSH, which is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And to systematically describe and classify the findings of pneumoconiosis on chest X films. Uh, the diseases are also called dust diseases as they typically result from the inhalation of dust like asbestos and silica. The films are graded uh, in accord with the ILO, which is the International Labor Office Standards that establishes the severity of the diseases, and, which is both important in the treatment and in compensation. So you have it sent to the B reader because they're specialists and accredited with NIOSH, and then it it's graded differently than a normal x-ray and it, it aids in the treatment and for compensation. Thank you, Nikki. Um, there are, we have had a number, number of questions come in about certain programs. Um, people aren't quite sure which program they may be eligible for because they may have worked at a number of different sites. Um, I encourage you to call any one of the programs. We'll make sure that you get to the right place um, that can best serve you. Um, another question that we have gotten is, um, again, about x-rays. Um, the question came, how come the x-ray showed disease? And then on my next x-ray, there wasn't anything found. Um, Aisha, can you do that one? I can. Thanks, Trish, and thank you to whoever answered, um, asked the question. So um, there are a couple of possibilities on why an x-ray uh, result may change over time. And I think it's important to remember that when we get any medical test completed, um, whether that's an x-ray or a lab draw, there's a possibility that the test may not result properly. And while as a physician, I don't want to undermine the importance of testing or screening. I did train in preventive medicine. Um, it's important to remember that no test is perfect. So at any given time, a test may result a finding um, that is there that isn't actually there. Um, the terminology you may have heard previously from one of the other panelists was false positive. Or the test may report that a finding isn't there that is actually there. And we uh, refer to that as a false negative. So assuming that both results um, on the particular x-ray for this person who answered, asked the question are accurate, then sometimes diseases do improve over time. So you may not have um, findings on your x-ray and that may actually be a good thing, right? It may be accurate. So um, if there is a discrepancy between your results from one x-ray to the next, um, what I would do is um, follow up with my doctor. I would get copies of the actual x-ray image because a lot of times we're just going off of the report. Um, I would get the x-ray image and see if you can um, schedule time with your doctor to have them review both of them to make sure that they're cross-referencing the report with the image um, and just to confirm that both are accurate. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for two more here, um, and there's been a number of questions asked in the chat that we've responded to as well. Um, how do the formal worker programs interact with home health care organizations? Um, Zach from WIP, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, so none of the former worker programs have any official relationship with the home health care agencies. Um, I think my personal experience is that they they do tell a lot of people about these programs. They refer people to us that we do screen. Um, and obviously, just like any other health care organization, if you sign a release with them, that gives them permission to your records. We'll send to them and they can have a copy. Um, but that's basically the only connection. Great. Thank you. Um, Greg, I'm going to end it with you on this one because um, we hear this quite often. I worked at the Department of Energy site for over 20 years. Why doesn't DOE have my employment records? Where did they go? Sure. Um, and there could be there could be quite a few reasons for this, but typically a lot of the folks, you know, Trish probably hears it more than some of the other folks because she's with the building trades program. And particularly for the construction subs, 
but subcontractors in general, but particularly the construction subs, it can be very difficult for DOE to find records all these years later because DOE was not the employer. I mean, we contracted with the company to provide the service. Um, so what we do is try to find those other records. We're not going to have a, an HR file on, on you know, a, a, a plumbing subcontractor or something like that, typically. Um, but what we might ha have is if that person had to go into a secure area, so they uh, had to obtain a clearance or were vetted, we might have that record. We might not. You know, the retention period for those was, was you know, not tremendously long in the early days. A lot of those records were destroyed appropriately, but some of them weren't. Inertia, you know, boxes get once they, you know, paper records, it takes effort to destroy. So sometimes we still have those. Sometimes we have sign in sheets. Sometimes if the individual had a dosimetry badge for, you know, they were monitored for radiation, we might have that. Or if they were involved in a, an incident or accident, a slip, trip, or fall, we might have that. But if the person was on site and it could have been multiple times and were never monitored for radiation or never involved in an incident or accident, um, and the DOE site didn't keep those sign-in sheets or gate logs, um, it is entirely possible that we will not have a, a record of that individual. Um, but, you know, if, if you were on site for years and, and uh, know that you were monitored or know that some of these records existed, and if it comes back, no records found, um, you can contact uh, Loki Harmon at the information, you know, the, the, the phone number or email up on the screen, or you can contact your local DOE site. Just to ask them because, again, you know, we go to great lengths to find records, but, you know, things happen, things are missed. So if you think something was missed in your case, we would be happy to give a second look and make absolute certain we, we don't have any records. Thanks, Greg. So we're running out of time for any more questions. But if your question did not get answered, I want to encourage you to reach out to the formal worker program that's listed here, um, as well as at the top, there's the DOE FWP website where the recording from this presentation will be in a couple of days, as will the PowerPoint presentation will be there. Um, many questions came in about um, the UIPA compensation claims. So we just at the very bottom of the screen wanted to share with you um, the toll free number for the Department of Labor program. Having said that, um, thank you to our panelists for joining us today, and thank you for all of you for taking the time to um, learn more about the former worker programs. We encourage you to call us, ask us questions. We're here to help. Um, when you leave the webinar in a minute, you are going to um, be asked to fill out a short three question survey. Shouldn't take you but a minute or so, um, but we would like your feedback. There's a spot in there that asks um, if there are other topics that you would be interested in. Um, in hearing about in future webinars from the former worker programs. We ask you um, to give us some feedback because we would like to do another webinar sometime in the future. Um, so thank you again all for participating. Feel free to reach out to any of us for if you have any other questions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you everyone and please reach out, get that screening. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, at best you will, uh, Get some peace of mind and know that you're healthier than you thought. And, uh, you know, if not, hopefully whatever they, they catch will be early and will lead to a more successful treatment. So you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. So I really encourage you to reach out. Thank well you. Well said. Thank you, Greg.